apparently we need more cars. Um, ice cream's important. We want to make sure the kids get there. Uh, I don't know about you. What's that? And the, and the adults. And the adults need to get there. I think the adults were more excited about piling in that car than the, than the kids were. Um, so this morning we're talking about humility um, as we work through this series about making room. And, and to be honest with you, I think sometimes this place of humbleness may be one of the most difficult things um, that we, we struggle with. It's, it's an undercurrent for us, but it's constant in many ways. It's that recognition of submission to God in the fullness of who we are, not just like bits and pieces of our lives, but the fullness of our lives. And I'm willing to bet that if I began asking questions about what are the things that, that you feel like you need to hold on to and be responsible for and the things that, that ultimately, you know, you wrestle with in regards to, to being humble, that everybody in this space would have something that they could share, that they could lift up, and yet the vast majority of us would not raise our hands to share that, right? God may know our hearts, but we don't necessarily want others to sometimes. And yet we're called to be transparent, and we're called to be authentic, and we're called to share in our struggles, and we're called to do all of these things as we seek to honor God as a community. And so just before I stepped up this morning, Stephanie walked up. She said, I think you, like there's just kind of an overwhelming feeling of glory this morning. It's kind of what's upon her. And that's not glory for us, and that's not glory about anything that we do. It's glorification of God and God alone. And though this is not at all something that was, you know, part of preparation for this morning, uh, you know, I, I do think that as we recognize the difference between humility and the difference between glory, we find ourselves in places where we must also recognize that God is worthy of everything that we can do to bring Him glory. And that our very human attempts rooted in ego and selfishness and self-centeredness, our, our humble attempts to attempt to claim glory for ourselves are futile. And so with that in mind, let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. And we acknowledge that you are worthy. We acknowledge that you are due all the glory. And in this moment, I I pray this simple thing as I prayed with our prayer team before I came out this morning. May this become a place and a people that are focused on it being all about you. In fact, what we desire is more of you and less of us in every facet and aspect of our lives. More of you and less of us in worship. More of you and less of us in our daily lives. More of you and less of us in our relationships. More of you and less of us in everything. May we experience your presence and your, pre- your peace and your glory this morning. And may we give you praise. In Christ's name, amen. As I mentioned, we're talking about humility. We're talking about that within the context of Philippians 2. So you guys may get those notes early if you're part of the the, the group that leads small groups. You see those things. We put it out on the sheets of paper. You pick up when you walk in. If you want to grab those, they're available. Uh, If you go through the QR code, you can see the notes as well. All sorts of options for you to pick up on this. If you're not familiar with what Philippians 2 is all about, it's this wonderful proclamation. Paul's writing to the church in Philippi. He's challenging them to come to this place of unity uh, in the face of things that would drive them apart, the places where they would have radically different opinions and experiences. And and in the midst of that, he says, the reason that we're able to do all of these things is because we have the example of Christ before us who gives up his divinity and his seat in heaven to come and to walk among us as a man on earth. One of the radically unbelievable but powerful parts of our faith, perhaps the most which ultimately leads to his being crucified and resurrected, part and parcel with those, is that that, in order for that thing to happen, for crucifixion and resurrection to happen, Jesus had to leave heaven and come to earth. He is the perfect example of what humility looks like. And so rather than providing you with a brief snapshot of what it is that Paul writes about, we're going to begin in Philippians 2, 1 through 11. You guys can stand with me for the reading of God's holy and precious word. 
So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ, Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So we've already acknowledged the fact that most of us wrestle with this thing of humility, this humbling of ourselves. The vast majority of us would feel much more comfortable in life if we could just either maintain status quo or work in this kind of uh, persistent arc towards being more and more recognizable as being awesome. <laughs> I mean, who, who doesn't acknowledge that, that there is a point in their lives where they like being treated with respect and recognition for whatever it is they may have accomplished, the job that they have done, the, the, the business they created, the education that they, that they attained. All of these different things are, are bits and pieces of the way that we perceive ourselves as having some form of glory in and of ourselves. And it's easy to get caught up in that. It's easy for us to desire to be recognized and to be at a point of prominence. It, in many ways, we're not terribly different than the Pharisees who would go to banquets and who would want the best seats. Or they would go to the synagogue and they would want to sit right up front so people could see them. And yet those people were often compared to being vipers. They were, they were inconsistent. They wanted recognition. They wanted outside appearance. But they did very, very little in terms of building up what was going on on the inside. To use another scriptural comparison or analogy or illustration, if you will, they were the cups that had been washed on the outside but had nothing on the inside but dirt and filth. And so we balance with that. We wrestle with it. And, and we wind up seeing that others very clearly did this as well. Paul writes to this church and he sends him this letter and he says, listen, giving them this conditional statement, right? Like, if you are doing these things, then something happens. And Paul ref refers to the facets of their faith that, that should be current realities. And, and I would argue that Paul's saying that they are. This idea of encouragement in Christ and comfort from love and participation in the Spirit and affection and sympathy. And he frames them conditionally to lead the audience to actively affirm the truth of these realities. And so to feel the weight of what it means to respond to this instruction. I'll be honest with you, much like the church in Philippi, I think that, that the vast majority of people in our church are, are recognizing of the encouragement in Christ and the comfort from love and participation of the Spirit and affection and sympathy. And Paul does not tell them these things because they're failing at it. He tells them these things so that they will be reminded of it and so that it will not slip through and become something that's merely background noise. Paul knew that this people would face difficulties and struggles. And he desired for them to persistently place others ahead of themselves. He goes on to tell them they should do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit but in humility to count others more significant than themselves. Setting aside their own interests for the interests of others. When you look at this in the English, you may miss kind of what's happening here. And we're not going to go off the tracks, but, 
we must acknowledge that he's using this term again and again, proneo in, in Greek, and it, it refers to mindset. It includes disposition and attitude as well as a right way of thinking. He's telling them effectively that they need to have a mind that is so attuned with what it is that God has called them to that their actions, their responses, the way that they engage with each other, the nature of who they are is being shaped by it. We see this in other parts of Scripture where the word is written upon our hearts and the result is that it cannot help but come from our mouths. It is not something that merely comes across in appearance. It is form, yes, but it is also function. There are many people in this world that would argue that church is a place where people go um, for appearances. And all too often, people who come to church have a tendency of making them right. We show up as though it's a social club. We come so that we can feel like we've checked it off our lists, but are we allowing it to shape and form the very nature of what's in ourselves? Is this something that we do on Sunday so that we mark it off the list, or is it something that we do that helps to form and shape the way that we act and speak and think and live? Because that's what Paul's instructing us to do. Not for the sake of appearance, but for the sake of life. He calls them to commit to this mindset of, of sharing in the way that they look at the world, of living in the world as a result of, of the way that they see it illustrated in Scripture, to see everything through the lens of the gospel, to have the same love and to be of one spirit not because they're able to do that on their own, but because in this conditional sense, these are the things that happen when we live as Christ has lived. If this is what we're all about, then the result will be lives that cannot help but to evidence the goodness and the grace of Jesus Christ. And when we look in the mirror, when we look at the people who sit in the seats next to us, are we seeing Jesus? Because we should be. And if you've come to a place in your life this morning where, where you're seeing more of yourself and less of Jesus, then there is a, a problem that is present. It's the reason I prayed what I did beforehand. It's the reason I prayed what I did with our, our group this morning before the service. More of you and less of me. That is more of God and less of me which is in radical conflict with what the world tells us. Whether you're watching television or listening to the radio or, or whatever it may be, reading magazines or, or online information, whatever it may be, the world tells us that it's all about us. And yet what we find again and again in the example of Christ that it is about humility and it is about sacrifice, and that it is about service, and it is about placing others ahead of ourselves. Quite frankly, that's what it looks like to be Christian. To place others ahead of ourselves. But Paul doesn't stop here. Paul goes on to provide this beautiful example that's, that's lived out through Jesus in a way that I probably couldn't put together if I, if I had to in the, in the flow and the nature of his wording. And he says this. He says, have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Like you don't get much more obedient or humble than that. And I think sometimes we glance over this. Maybe we talk about it a little bit at Easter, but I don't want us to miss what's happening here for a second. Like the idea of what happens on the cross. You guys have a recognition of, of the nature of what the crucifixion was. The crucifixion was the death of criminals and of slaves. The crucifixion was not the way that the average citizen of Rome would have been treated, or for that matter, the average citizen of Jerusalem would have been treated. It was something that was done as this point of, of debasing them. 
It wasn't beheading like John the Baptist experienced in a room where he was with someone who quite literally took his head. It is hanging someone on a wooden cross until their body is no longer able to support them and they ultimately suffocate in public. Now think about how antithetical that is to a world that tells us that we need to do everything in the world so that people see us as doing it just right. And I know there are some of you in this room who are that way. You are perfectionists like me. I raise my hand with you. Maybe you're a three on the Enneagram. And the last thing in the world that you want is for people to see you fail in some way. And you are so focused on that that there are things that you will not do because you don't do it well enough. So you leave that behind and you go on to something that you can do better. Every single one of us has points of struggle and places where we wrestle and we sometimes lose with what it is that we wrestle with. And the reality of what it is that Paul is proclaiming here is that when we do that, it is okay. It's okay for us to wrestle. It's okay for us to struggle because at the end of the day, it's not about us anyway. It's about Jesus. And we see this humbleness lived out in the nature of Christ. As he comes to walk among us, as he gives up his place in heaven. And in his very incarnation, he takes on the form of a slave Between being like God and being like a slave, there's this unbelievable gap. And if it seems shocking to you when you read this, imagine how shocking it would have been to like first century people in Philippi who could not have imagined what it would have been like for a king to have left his place, given up all the glory, and taken on human form. Like for the Greeks, the Romans, for those who, the Greeks coming before, the Romans who were present in this place, they would have thought that that was just unbelievably ridiculous. Who in the world would give up status and power to be human? And I think that we lose sight of that when we read this. And I think that some of that comes from our own ego. We think, well, hey, being human ain't so bad. Sometimes. Sometimes it's pretty rough. Sometimes we deal with persecution and brokenness and infirmity. We recognize that the older we get, the, the harder it is to do the things that we used to do. We realize that we are in these finite vessels that one day will eventually stop working. And in truth, whether it's the limitations of our bodies or the recognition that we wrestle with things and sometimes lose, both of those things should point us to a place where we cannot help but be submittive and appreciative of what it is that God does for us. That He is our sufficiency, that He is our blessing, that He meets our needs, that He feel, fills our lungs with breath, that He allows our hearts to work, that all of those things happen because God has orchestrated it and holds us in the palm of His hand. But the radical nature of what Paul's saying here doesn't stop there. In a very real way, what we're seeing Paul do and what we see Jesus do in his very life is to rework the nature of what happens in, in Genesis. As humanity is made in the image of God, so in the incarnation Christ is made in the likeness of man. And by taking on humanity, Christ repeats and replicates and reverses the story of Adam. That Christ is fixing the things that were devastated by sin and separation. God had created us to be in his image so that we would be quite literally like him. 
And when that didn't work out, as a result of sinfulness and brokenness and a desire for self over God, that Christ became the mechanism that would allow us to become right with our God again. That as he emptied himself out and became like us, he offers us the opportunity through his life and his death and his resurrection, through his example, to become more like him. In fact, I believe what Scripture teaches us again and again and again is that through the blood of Christ, we are not seen as these fallen and broken vessels any longer, but we are seen through him as he is. We take on his righteousness because he took on our flesh and our sin. We take on his life and resurrection because he took on our suffering and our death. And so as we began this morning talking about this idea of glory, we are not worthy of glory, but God is. We are not worthy of position or prominence or place or the presence of ego within us. And the only way that we have a hope for correcting those problems and those struggles and giving us this place of, of presence and the ability to be with God is through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I've had the opportunity several times over the last couple of weeks to kind of share with people about the, um, the way that, that I came to be a Methodist, and you guys will probably be maybe hearing more about this, but um, there was a point in my life where I had grown up in a, in a, in a denomination that was, that was very centered on like what, what we could do. Like if we, if we just did enough. And the reality of it is that we can never, ever, ever do enough. And as a 19-year-old man, I went to church with my now wife, Jenny. We were dating in college. We hadn't been dating very long. And we went to a Methodist church in Tuscaloosa. And I heard a man named Dan Kilgore, amazing pastor, preach on grace. And he didn't just preach on like this kind of superficial grace. He preached on grace as like this prevenient thing that's at work before we even recognize it. This justifying thing that moves us beyond who we are into being who God is, is calling us to be, the sanctifying thing that makes us become more and more and more like Christ. It's, it's this Wesleyan idea of what grace is. And for the first time in my life, I came to the realization that it had nothing to do with me and everything to do with Jesus. And in my own, like, limited vocabulary and feeble nature, if you will, recognizing my humanity, that is what I'm doing today. And it's what I need to do every single day that we are together. It's to proclaim that if it was up to us, we would never get to heaven. But through Christ and Christ alone. Because he was willing to pour himself out Greek word kenosis, to empty himself out, giving up temporarily his divine glory so that he could be a servant, to live and to die, to be punished, to be crucified, so that one day we could leave these feeble and faulted bodies behind that we could step away from the impact of sin and death and so that we instead could share in his righteousness. And the reason that we can proclaim that to be true is written across the pages of Scripture, but it's undeniably in Philippians 2, 9, and 11. Hear it. Therefore God has highly exalted and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that, in at, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Like this humble servant, this one who has left heaven and come to earth, is given an opportunity, the, the ability through the power and the presence of God the Father and his work through Jesus the Son and through the, the blessing of the Holy Spirit 
to bring to fruition what it is that needed to be done in order to rectify the brokenness of sin and death in the state of humanity. This is a quote of Isaiah 45, 23b. To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue it shall swear allegiance. And when we talk about this, this exaltation, the reality of it is it's universal lordship. It's a status that's given by God which counters all previous humbling. And it's powerful. But Jesus in his sacrifice ultimately lives and dies and is resurrected, but he also ascends. He goes back to that rightful place in heaven. the place that he deserves, the place that he was, and the place that he ever will be. This is an effective way of saying that Jesus is Lord and meaning it. It's the reason when we have baptisms, it's not merely a proclamation that Jesus is our Savior. Everybody wants a Savior. Very few of us want to live lives that are reflective of what it means to have a Lord. Because we like to be Lord. We like to be the one in charge and the one who makes the decisions. And yet we are not worthy of that. Again, this would have been a radical statement for first century Christians and Jews. And it should be radical and recognized to us as well. We are proclaiming our allegiance, our faithfulness, our recognition that Jesus is above us because he deserves to be and yet he was with us because he loved us so much. So I wonder if you are a people this day that recognize not only that God loves you, but that the fullness of that love is made clear to us as Jesus humbles himself and dies for us. Are you a people this day that recognize his authority and his presence, that, that perhaps have a better understanding of who it is that Christ is because he lived that life? And who submit to him because he offers us new life. Jesus was greater than Caesar. And he's greater than any modern earthly ruler. And yet he loves us. As a result, we should live lives that are not rooted in status or position or prominence or ego, but lives that are rooted in Christ alone. May he shape our words and our actions. May his example illuminate what it is for us to look like and live like him. And may we submit the fullness of who we are, recognizing that in humility, Jesus sets the tone, but in his righteousness, he provides for us a way to be with him in eternity. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize that far too often we are desirous of position and authority and power. And we recognize that way too often we're interested in the way that the world perceives us instead of recognizing the importance of the way that you see us. And Father, you call us in the midst of this scripture to be people who place others ahead of ourselves, to, to be people who submit to your authority, to be people who live lives that are reflective of that, not merely in thought, but in word and in deed, in the fullness of who we are. Father, that is what you desire from us. 
submission and faithfulness. Recognition of your goodness and your grace and responsiveness to the example that you set. So may we set aside everything that we hold on to. Every evidence of position, power, and status. And instead, may we take on your example of servanthood. Because as we serve and care and love others, we're able to help them see the example that you set. As we proclaim the truth of your gospel, we're able to inform them of the radicalness of what it is that you do for us. And as we humble ourselves, we make room for you to do whatever you want to in the midst of our lives. Having faith that your will and your word and your way for us is better than anything that we could ever orchestrate or plan for ourselves. So, Father, we submit to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.